Hello and welcome to the Faith, I mean, uh, <laughs> Calvary Baptist Church uh, uh, internet service again. And uh, we hope that we'll be able to be again soon, but until then, this is the best we can do. And so we're going to look into God's Word together today. Uh, but before we do that, let's hear a, a few songs. to us. We thank you for your word. We thank you, though, that we can't meet together. We each can be unified in you and have common fellowship because we each have the Holy Spirit in our hearts. And I pray that we hear your word today. Your Holy Spirit will take the word that's spoken and touch our hearts and move our hearts and let us understand your word and apply it to our lives so we can be better servants of yours. And we encourage us today and strengthen us. And you give us the supply of needs, whether it be spiritual needs or physical needs. We encourage us today. Help us accomplish your will this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. A um, couple of announcements. Um, we're not sure when we're going to be able to get back together. As of right now, uh, this time, the uh, state of emergency is supposed to be lifted on the 6th. So we're planning uh, on the 10th to get back together. And uh, we'll let you know a little bit more as the days get closer. Um, we'll have to play it by ear and see what how the government, uh, if they extend their stay of emergency or anything like that. So, uh, but right now, as of what we've heard right now yet, uh, the 6th is supposed to end, and so we're planning to get together on the 10th, probably have separate services. But again, we'll, I'll let everybody know in email and things. Uh, but please be praying for one another. Uh, this is an unusual time uh, in uh, our lives, and, and uh, pray for each other. Encourage one another. There's many physical needs, spiritual needs, financial needs, uh, jobs, and things like that. So uh, pray for one another. And then uh, remember, uh, of course, the church, and that we'll be able to get back together as soon as the Lord would have us to. And so, all right, let's go ahead and continue our study from last week. Uh, last week we talked about, uh, at least a uh, week before that, we started talking about two questions. Uh, the first uh, question was, uh, why oh, why do um, bad things happen to good people? And of course, uh, we answered that there really aren't any good people, uh, but even those who have trusted Christ as their Savior and then have had the righteousness of Christ imputed to them, uh, who are righteous in standing, uh, even them uh, 
God doesn't um, allow bad things to happen. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, um, all things work together for good to them that love God, to those that are, who are called according to His purpose. So all things work together for good. God only accomplishes things good. He brings things into our life that accomplish good uh, to us, even though they're not pleasant sometimes. And we look at that in detail. So today we want to continue, uh, just to give you a couple things, a couple of benefits of suffering. Uh, we mentioned many, many, but just a couple of more. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, it says, For none of those things which thou, thou shalt suffer, behold. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, and many, and ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days, uh, but... Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. So a crown of life is one of the rewards for suffering. And so whatever suffering we must endure, if we receive a crown of life, it is worth whatever suffering we have to endure. Another benefit, um, in Philippians chapter 3, verse 8 says, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss, for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I suffer the loss of all things, and do count them but dumb, be that I might win Christ, attain Christ, have a closer fellowship with Christ. And so any suffering we go through that brings us closer to Christ, that gives us a, a, a closer relationship with Him, is worth the suffering. And so that's another benefit of suffering. Now Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10 says, For it became Him, uh, for, whom ye are, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons into glory, and making the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. Suffering perfects us, makes us complete, makes us able to be what God would have us to be. And then in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, I'm sorry, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1, uh, the second part says, For uh, he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. So, uh, the suffering uh, ha helps us to be sanctified, sanctifies us. And so there are many, 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 many we could talk for days on uh, the, the benefits of suffering. Uh, but there are many benefits of suffering. And so God does allow us to suffer, but he doesn't allow us to suffer for naught, for no reason, for no good purpose. And so suffering is good. Now we don't, when we're going through it, sometimes don't think it's good. Uh, maybe we don't think it's um, good, but it is, and we'll talk a little bit about more, more about that. So, the first question we talked about was, why do bad things happen to good people? And then the second question we want to consider today is, why do good things happen to bad people? Why do good things happen to bad people? Um, I know you probably, maybe you've thought about that before, um, but the simple answer, again, just like the simple answer to the other question is, they don't. <laughs> Good things don't happen to bad people. Uh, you say, well, hey, wait a minute, I can tell you some situations where some bad people got some good things, okay? Uh, well, I'll explain a little bit to you, but um, just as there are things that seem to hinder, but in reality they benefit, there are things that seem to benefit, but really hinder. And just as there are many people think what many people think is bad is really good. Uh, what many people think is good is really bad. So sometimes what we think is good is not good, and what we think is bad is not bad. Okay? Now, true benefit, the true benefit of something depends on certain things. Uh, number one, it depends on your perspective, how you see things. Whether it's good or not depends on how you see it, what perspective you have, and then what the purpose is, what the purpose of the thing is, what, is, what God's trying to accomplish through that. And uh, so those two things uh, are what define something as good. Um, number one, let's look at the perspective. There are many perspectives on things. Um, we see things from different perspectives. Different people see things from different perspectives. But many times we look at things through temporal or material perspective. So something from a temporal or material perspective may look good, and uh, it may be good from a material and temporal perspective, but that's not the only perspective, and that's not the most important perspective. We also must consider things from an eternal or spiritual perspective. 
And so sometimes something that appears to uh, benefit, uh, it only benefits in a temporal way, it doesn't benefit spiritually. And sometimes that which seems to not benefit temporally uh, benefits us spiritually, and vice versa. So often that which seems to benefit us temporally or materially hinders us uh, eternally or spiritually. And oftentimes that which benefits us eternally or spiritually seems to hinder us temporally or materially. Comfort and ease seem to be desirable while discomfort and hardship seem to be undesirable. Most people seek pleasure while seeking by any means to avoid pain. But we must consider uh, the perspective. What, what, in what way is this good or in what way is this bad? In what way does this benefit and what way does this hinder? Some things that you know, we, we many times judge things from a material perspective and say, oh, it's good that this happened. And from a material perspective, it may. But if it's a detriment to your spiritual perspective, it's not worth it. It's really bad. Okay? And some things that, that you look at and you deem bad from a material perspective are good spiritually. And some things that or you deem uh, bad from a spiritual, uh, good from a spiritual perspective are bad from a, from a material perspective. And so you see the perspective. Then the purpose. Uh, God has a purpose in everything. He has a purpose in allowing suffering, pain, hardship, things like that. And God's purpose in allowing pain to the godly is for their good. All things work together for good to those that love God and call according to His purpose. The things work together for good. God is, His purpose is for our benefit, for our spiritual edification, for our growth, uh, for our ministry. And so God's purpose in allowing suffering, pain, things that we would deem not desirable, is for our good. And so, if God's purpose is for our good, then whatever we're going through is good, it's not bad. And uh, we need to see it from an eternal perspective, and we need to see it from God's purpose. Okay? In James chapter 1, verse 2 through 4, says, My brethren, count all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, that's trials, uh, knowing that uh, the trying of your faith worketh patience, uh, that patience have us per per perfect work, and be perfect entire or nothing. And so there's a benefit. James tells us there's a benefit in the trying of your faith. It works patience. And so in order to get that patience, if we have to go through hardship to get that patience, it's worth it. And if God puts us through hardships to help us to become patient, that's a good thing. He's doing a good thing, not a, not a bad thing. Okay. James chapter 1, also verse 9 and 10 says, let the brother of low degree rejoice that he is exalted, but the rich in that he is made low. Um, because of the flower of the grass, he shall pass away. So it says, let the rich rejoice that he is made low. Now, you know, most of us don't rejoice when we lose all of our money. <laughs> okay, Let the rich rejoice when he's made low. Because uh, it, God is trying to teach us something. He's helping us to grow spiritually. And so uh, if God allows us to face things that are hardships, financial setbacks, and things like that, uh, that is for our benefit, for our good. And so we are to uh, rejoice. That's the command. Let the brother of Lodi rejoice, and let the rich man rejoice that he's made low. So we should rejoice. We should count kind of joy when we fall into diverse temptation. First Peter chapter 5, verse 10 says, but the God of all grace, who hath called us into his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. So our temporal suffering, suffer for a little while, temporal suffering makes us perfect, established, strengthened, and settled in our faith. And so the temporal suffering, the suffering for a little while, is good. Because it makes us perfect and stable and strengthened okay? and settled in our faith. And so that's good. So m most of the things that we try to avoid sometimes are good. And Paul, of course, we, we mentioned in, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul um, talked about his thorn in the flesh. Uh, that that uh, was a thorn that he, he requested that the Lord remove that three times. And the Lord said, no, I put that there for a purpose. And it's a good purpose. 
And Paul, when he realized that, he said, oh, that's good. I'm glad it's there now. I'm glad that hardship. And so the, the thing that he wanted to be taken away, the heart, because the, heart, the hardship didn't change. God didn't take it away, so it remained. It didn't change. What changed was his perspective and his view of God's purpose changed. And that's the key to enduring uh, hardship, is to have a right perspective and to have a right purpose in mind. Realizing that God is doing this for my benefit, not for my destruction, not for my, uh, you know, not for to hinder me, uh, but to uh, work in that hardship or through that hardship to perfect me. And so it is good. So hard things are good. So uh, God's purpose in allowing pleasure to the ungodly is for their destruction. So God's purpose in allowing Hardship for the godly is for our good, for our perfecting. God's purpose in allowing pleasure or good or whatever that they would call good to the ungodly is for their destruction. Sometimes I know we look at the um, ungodly people who don't care about God, who don't seek to please God, and they're prospering. And we say, why? What's the deal here? That's not fair or whatever. Um, Joshua chapter 11 verse 20 says, For it was the Lord... It is of the Lord to harden their hearts that they should come against Israel in battle, that he might destroy them utterly, and that he might have no and that they might have no favor, but that he might destroy them, as the Lord commanded Moses. So God's purpose in allowing the enemies of the Lord to come against them was for the purpose of destroying them. For their so their their seeming success was God's uh, way of destroying them. In Romans chapter 1, verse 28 says, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do the things which are not convenient, okay? not, not profitable for them. And so God let them have their way. And so the ungodly thought that they were succeeding in their ungodliness, in their rebellion against God. And God let them have their way. And they thought that they were successful in their rebellion against God. But that success in the rebellion against God was leading to their destruction, their eternal destruction. And so it was not good. So good things don't happen to bad people. Okay? Uh, in uh, Psalm 73, which we'll look at today, starting today, we'll look at the next couple weeks, uh, Psalm 73, the psalmist pondered just that issue. You know, why do good things happen to bad people? And uh, it bothered him so much that he almost gave up on God. Uh, in his own words, in Psalm chapter uh, 37, uh, 73, verse 2 and 16, he said, it said, um, My feet were almost gone, and my steps had well nigh slipped. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. The psalmist couldn't understand when he saw the success of the wicked. And then he saw his own hardship that he endured and suffered. And it didn't make sense to him. He said, God, it doesn't seem fair. I'm struggling to, uh, you know, to live for you, and I desire to live for you, and I'm uh, fighting against the world, the flesh, and the devil. I'm resisting temptation. Uh, I'm suffering hardships. And there's that guy over there. He doesn't care about you at all. He's just materialistic um, and uh, fulfills the lust of the flesh and does whatever he wants, and he seems to succeed. How, how can that be? And the psalmist was really distraught about that. Until something happened in his life, and he understood, he realized that, uh, that what, what, was, what God was really doing, that anything bad in his life was actually for his good, and anything good in their life was actually for their bad, <laughs> for their destruction. And when he realized that, it totally changed his whole uh, perspective, his attitude, everything changed. Okay, and so we're going to look at Psalm 73. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to turn to Psalm 73. We'll be looking at uh, verse by verse. Uh, first of all, he starts out, interestingly, he starts out with the climax. He starts out with the conclusion. Okay? Uh, he said, now I understand that God is good. That's basically what he was saying. He goes, now I, I, he goes, I didn't understand before. And then he'll go through the process. He'll, he'll start verse 2. He'll tell you where he was, the problem he had, starting verse 2. Uh, and then work all the way down to the end of the chapter, but he starts with the conclusion. He goes, you know, now I understand, but before I didn't, but now I do. I understand. God is good. Okay, so in verse 1, he said, truly, God is good to Israel. 
even to such as are of a clean heart. Now, if we, if we read uh, verse 2 and following, you wouldn't, he didn't think that. Okay? He originally didn't think that. Just like Paul, he originally didn't think that what he was suffering, going through, was for his good. And then when God revealed it to him and he knew it was, he was glad for it. He was thankful for it. He was happy for it. Same thing happened here in Psalm chapter 73. And so, but originally he thought that uh, he didn't think God was good. So verse uh, 2 and then verse 15 and 16, we read a little bit of those, is the first, word, first uh, point is this confusion. Well, first we started out with the conclusion that God is good. And then he says, let me, let me show you how I arrived at that conclusion. Uh, first he was confused. Okay, verse 2 and then verse 16 and 15 and 16. Uh, we looked at those before, but it says, verse 2 says, But as for me, my foot was almost gone. My steps were well nigh slipped. Uh, if I say I speak, I will speak thus, behold, I should offer, offend against a generation of thy children. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. And he said, I, I was considering this. When I thought this, when I looked at this, it almost made me give up on God. It almost made me lose my faith. Because you know, it didn't appear to be fair, again, that the wicked seemed to prosper. And the righteous seemed to have hardships left and right. And that didn't seem fair. It didn't seem right to him. And it was so uh, weighing on his mind that he almost gave up on the faith. Uh, so that was where he's at. First of all, his first was he was confused. Uh, and then we look at the condition of this confusion. Well, what made him confused? What did he look at? What did he see that made him confused? Well, uh, verse 12, uh, 4 through verse 12. Verse 4 through verse 12. And we'll look at that one verse at a time. First of all, uh, when he looked at the wickedness, they seemed to have no pain in death. They lived however they wanted. Verse 4 says, For there are no bands in their death but their strength is firm. In other words, when they come to the end of their life, they look back with no regrets. They don't have any re regrets. Um, you know, it reminds me of uh, a song by Frank Sinatra, you know, uh, this song called My Way, you know, and I don't know the exact words, but, uh, it says, you know, when I come to the end of my life and look back and, just, and I saw that I did it my way, my way, my way. That's what the wicked do. They, they, they think that they have succeeded in life. They got their own. Oh, own way. Little do they realize that that way is leading them to destruction. But they think that they are a success in life. So they think that they can live however they They live how they want. They did whatever they want. They did it their way. They rebelled against God. They did whatever. It was their, they were the ruler of their life. They were the master of destiny. And they think they succeeded. You know, that's many people say, I'm the master of my own destiny. You know, I'll determine what I want to do. I'm not subject to anybody. And they think that's good. That's not good. It leads to destruction. If you don't submit yourself to God and subject yourself to God, bow before Him, you will not be eternally secure in His presence. Okay? You will be in hell. And so, uh, they think that their life was a success because they were able to do what they wanted to do. They lived the way they wanted to do. They, they did whatever they wanted to do. And they consider themselves success. And so when they come to that, that life, they, they look back upon their life and they're satisfied. They think they're, they have a, they've been able to do what they wanted to do. Not knowing that if they were rebelling against God, then their whole life was a failure and they're about to enter eternity and receive the reward of their life that they were even unaware that was wrong, maybe. Okay? So... He looked at, but, but the psalmist, from his perspective, he was looking from a temporal perspective, realize, uh, from an eternal perspective, there's an eternal perspective and a temporal perspective, and he was looking at a temporal perspective. He thought it was good. He was jealous of all this, and he will say that in those words a little bit later, but he was jealous of the wicked, because he thought what they were experiencing was good, when in fact what they were experiencing was bad. It appeared to be good, but it was not good for them. It was bad. It was leading them to destruction. Um, and so they, the first thing he had an issue with, the first problem he had, he saw that, uh, you know, maybe, maybe he saw those who were righteous and they were concerned about their righteousness and their holiness and their failures. And they, in the end of the life, they had regrets. They wished they had lived for the Lord more and they had witnessed more and they had done this more. 
And the, 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 the ungodly, they, didn't, they thought they were successful because they did it their way, you know. And that was the difference. And so he, maybe he looked at the, the uh, ungodly and saw that uh, in death they seemed to be satisfied and then a Christian or one who wanted to please God uh, didn't have, you know, confidence that, you know, we, you know, everything we do we must do in the power of the Holy Spirit. And if we don't do it, it's not of eternal benefit. And there are times in our life when we look back and we've sinned and we regret that. Um, but the wicked man has no regret for his sin. He doesn't understand his sin. He didn't think he sinned. And so it's good to have a regret for your sin because that means you have an awareness of your sin and you can confess it and get it right. And so it's actually better to have an awareness of your sin, your weakness, and your shortcomings. Uh, and... You know, we look back upon our life and we see our shortcomings and we regret those shortcomings and we you know, pray that the Lord would allow us to, you know, the rest of our life to, to live right and we have, we have, we have, we live in constant uh, concern with whether we're doing right or not. The wicked have no constant concern with whether they're doing right or not. And so, in, in as a matter of living, it seems to be easier. They do whatever they want and they're happy with it. We can't do whatever we want. If we, when we do what we want, we, when we obey the flesh, we regret it if we have the Holy Spirit within us. We're true Christians. And so it seems to me that the, those who don't care about God uh, at the end of life have a happier time than those who do care about God. Uh, but again, he was looking with the wrong perspective and the wrong purpose in his life. Okay. And then number, uh, verse 5, he said... Um, they are not in troubles as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Okay? He said, no plagues in life. They have, they have no, look, they have no plague in life. They do whatever they want. There's no hindrance. There's no thing that they can't do. They do whatever they want to do. There's no, nothing that holds them back. And so they have no, no plagues in, in their life. And we as Christians, we can't do what we, we're, we're constantly struggling and fighting against the flesh, aren't we? We're constantly doing what we don't want to do and constantly not doing what we really know we should do. And there's a struggle, and there's a conflict. And so when he looked at the, the wicked person, he did whatever he wanted to do. And he had no conflict. And we do what we know we shouldn't be doing, and we're constantly struggling, and, uh, and, and we're constantly uh, denying the flesh and having to put away the, the works of the flesh, and we're having, having to... Uh, rely upon the Spirit, and we're having to, it's a daily struggle to live right in this world. And the, the, there's no daily struggle with those who are wicked, who, who do whatever they want to do. And there's no uh, daily struggle to please God instead of pleasing themselves, because that's their goal in life, to please themselves. They do whatever they want to do, whatever pleases them. We can't live like that. As a Christian, if we did whatever pleased us, if we were truly a Christian, it would bother us. It would not allow us to, God's Holy Spirit would not allow us to get away with doing whatever we want to do. But the guy ungodly can do whatever they want to do. And they're at peace with it. And we have a struggle. We constantly uh, struggle to defeat the, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, the world. The, it's constantly struggle against the influence of the world. It's constantly struggle against the devil. And so we are constantly struggling. And they're not struggling. They're obeying the lust of the flesh. They, they don't have any struggle against it. They're obeying the uh, world. They're living in the world. They're, they're going along with the flow of the world. There's no conflict. Uh, and they, you know, they don't have, their, their goal is to please themselves and the devil has them in, their, in his hand and they're doing what he wants and there's no struggle, it seems like. And so when the, when the psalmist looked at them, he said, there's no plague in their life. They have no trouble. They have no struggle like other men. They, they, don't, they, don't, they do whatever they want to do and it doesn't bother them. And so it bothered him, it bothered him that they could live however they want to and do whatever they want. But I can't. And so he was envious of the wicked. Again, his perspective was wrong. And his purpose was wrong. And then, verse 6, he said this. Therefore, pride compasseth them about as a chain. Violence covers them as a garment. There's no punishment in pride. Uh, they, they be whatever they want to be. Okay? They do whatever they want to do. They be whatever they, they can be whatever they want to be, and their, their pride and there's no punishment in pride. In other words, they don't have to suffer the consequences of their pride. Okay? 
God doesn't allow us to suffer. He, he doesn't allow us to, to be proud without suffering consequences because he loves us. You know, Paul, when he, in, in uh, Corinthians, when we studied about Paul, he said, um, because of the lens of the revelation given me, there, there was given me a form of flesh, lest I should be exalted above measure. God wouldn't let him be proud. God brought these things into his life, these hardships into his life, so that he wouldn't be proud. Because a proud person is useless to God. God uses the humble. God works through the humble. And uh, so pride will make us useless to God. Um, but those who don't care about God, they can dwell in pride. They can live in pride. And, uh, but we can't. And so there's no punishment in their pride. They could they, be whatever they want to be. You know, they can have gay pride parades and be whatever they want to be. And, and take pride in it even though it's against uh, God, against the Creator. Um, there's pride in that. We can't be proud against God if we're going to be uh, righteous people. Uh, we have to humble ourselves. We're constantly having to humble ourselves, and the ungodly are proud. And we have to be humble. We have to be submissive. And we have to not care about what we want. We care about what God wants. And so we have to be humble. And... Uh, so when he looked at that, he said, they are, they're pride and they don't suffer any consequence. Nobody stops them from being proud. Uh, and God always stops me from being proud. But it's a good thing. Okay? God stopping us from being proud is a good thing. God humbling us. God humiliating us. God doing some things in our life that um, burst our bubble when we think too much of ourselves is good. God's allowing the pride to swell up and those who are wicked to be confident and be and boast in their wickedness is for their destruction leads to their destruction so it's not good it's not good uh, but again the psalmist's perspective is wrong and so he thought that their pride was unpunished they weren't refrained in their pride and he was and so he thought that's not fair so, the number se uh, the verse seven says, uh, "Their eyes stand out with fatness; they have more than the heart could wish. There's no poverty in their desire. They, they have what do they want? Anything they want, they can have. If they want it, they go get it. They have it. They fulfill the lust of their lips. They fulfill the lust of their eyes. They fulfill their prior life. They do whatever they want. They go wherever they want. They see what they want. They they have what do they want." They can get wherever they want. Um, we can't. We have. To, if you're if you're seeking to live in the purpose of God, we can only have what He gives us to fulfill that purpose. If we're living for God, whatever He gives us is a tool to accomplish His purpose. It's not something that we have because we want. We don't. We don't get whatever we want and have whatever we want. We have what God gives us, and we're thankful for it. Um, but he looked at the look at, looked at the wicked who who are wicked. They they don't care about God. They're not trying to please God. They're trying to please themselves. They're trying to live for themselves. They're trying to they don't they don't even have God in their mind at all. They don't. They're against God. They're rebellious. They're they're not considering God at all. And he's over here saying, I'm seeking to live my life for you, but I have to deny myself and I can't have the things I want. I can't do the things I want. I can't go the places I want. I I have to do what God wants me to do, and I'm restricted. They're unrestricted. They can have whatever they want. I can't have whatever I want. I have to have what God gives me to uh, use for Him. I can't even use it for myself. Okay? And so he looked at that. He thought, They're, what they have is good, what I have is bad. He had a wrong perspective. All right? And then in verse 8, it says, They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression, they speak loftily. Okay? There's no um, prevention in their speech. They say whatever they want to say. There's no restraint. There's no, uh, they, they say whatever their heart desires to say, they say it. Um, but we as Christians, we can't do that. We can't say, what, in fact, we shouldn't be even thinking, but sometimes we can't say what we think because we shouldn't even be thinking that. We should be thinking God's side. So it's not... We must speak what is edifying. We must speak the truth in love. That's our 
mandate from God is to speak the truth. We can't say whatever we want to say. We can only speak truth and speak what's edifying to others. That's our mandate from God. And so we are restricted in our speech. Okay? We have the, the, the provision in our speech. We can't say whatever we want to say. We are restricted. We can't say certain things. We can't, uh, can't give voice to certain ideas because that would be wrong. We need to speak the truth. Um, we should be thinking those things. But the wicked men, or the, those who don't care about God, have no prevention to speak. They say whatever they want to say. So it says they speak loftily. They speak wickedly and they speak loftily. They say whatever they want to say. They use whatever words they want to use. Any words they want to use, they use it. Anything they want to say, any expression they want to express, they express it. We can't do that. If our goal and desire is to live for the Lord and for the edification of saints, we have to restrict our tongues. We have to um, put a put a lock on a key in our tongues. Okay, we we can't say what we uh, whatever we feel like saying. That's not to to the edifying. And so, but the wicked seem like they say whatever they want to say. And they want to say it, they say it. Get it off their chest or whatever. And so we have restriction in our speech. They have no restriction in their speech. And so the psalmist was saying, man, look at that. He can say whatever. He wants. I can't do that. And so he was saying, that's good, and what I, my restrictions are bad. So he was thinking. Okay. All right, and then number, uh, verse 9 says, And they set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue uh, walketh through the earth. Okay. Their mouth is against heaven. There's no um, prudence in their control. They curse whoever they want. You know, they, uh, the mouth of a wicked spews forth wickedness and in a wicked way. We have to speak the truth in love. They can say whatever they want without regard for any any concern for anybody else. Without regard for God. And they curse heaven. They, they set their mouth against heaven. Wicked people, you know, curse God. Uh, we can't curse God. Well, we don't want to curse God, but uh, there's no consequence. They, they're they're, they're they seem to get away with expressing things even against God. Uh, that's not good for them. Uh, but we are restricted in our speech. We can only say what is edifying. We can only say what is glorifying to God. Because, and we shouldn't want that. Uh, but they can say whatever they want to say, and they don't. They get away with it. They, they don't. They aren't. It seems like they're not called into account. You know, I heard of a guy one time who uh, was an atheist. And he stood up before a group of people and said, I'm going to prove that there's no God. And he goes, and he cursed God and said, I give God five minutes to strike me dead with lightning. If he doesn't, then he dares no God. And so he cursed God and he stood there and nothing happened. And so he said, see, there's no God. He cursed God and nothing happened. Well, I don't know. That was a long time ago I heard the illustration. If that's a true illustration, he's probably in hell suffering right now. He didn't get away with it. You know, he... God doesn't work on a time level of man. But you can't just curse God and get away with it. But he thought he could. And it seemed like he was. And the people around him said, oh, he didn't, he didn't get anything. God didn't strike him dead. Even though he cursed God and challenged God and denied God. God didn't do anything. Well, he, God is patient and uh, long-suffering. But no sin goes unpunished. No sin goes unpunished. There's never, ever a sin that goes unpunished. Uh, no sin goes unpunished. You know, our sins have been punished. By, uh, Christ took the punishment of our sins at Calvary. And those who bear their own sins will suffer the consequence of those sins. No sin. God is not going to overlook any sin. No sin goes unpunished. Uh, might not be punished right now. And so those who get bold in sinning and bold in cursing God because they don't see the immediate consequences but God will bring those consequences eventually. But they, they can do whatever. They can say whatever they want. They curse whatever they want. You know, swear whatever. Do anything they want. And it seems like they do it with impunity. They, they, they're not held to the account like we would be if we did something like that. And then verse 10. Uh, we'll finish up these next two. And then verse 10 says... Um, Therefore his people return thither, and the waters of a full cup are wrung out into them. There's no proviso in their prosperity. Okay? Uh, they enjoy whatever they want. It seems like they have 
endless supply of things that bring them pleasure and joy and entertainment and whatever. Okay? And we can't. We can't. There's certain things we can't do. There's certain things we, we can't do. If we're living to please God, there's certain things we can't do. They're not living to please God, so they can do whatever they want to do. And there's no uh, restriction to their enjoyment. They can enjoy whatever they want to enjoy. You know, we, if you're a Christian and you want, and your goal is to live for the Lord, you can't obviously be not drunk with wine. You can't uh, be drunk with wine. They can you know, drink whatever they want, you know, have a full cup of you bring out to them, they can do whatever they want. They can have whatever they want, enjoy whatever they want. Uh, but we can't. If our goal is to please the Lord and live with the Lord, we can't do that. We can't do whatever we want. We can't say whatever we want. We can't go wherever we want. We can't drink whatever we want. We can't eat whatever we want. We can't do anything what we want. Okay? And that, if you think that that's a bad thing, then you've got a wrong perspective, like the psalmist did here. His perspective was wrong. He saw things wrongly. He, he was looking at things from a temporal perspective. And from the temporal perspective, it looks like, you know, sometimes from a temporal perspective, things that are bad look good. And from a temporal perspective, things that are good look bad. But we need to see things from a biblical and an eternal perspective, and a godly perspective. And so we need to, to learn to do that. Okay? And so uh, there's no, they can enjoy whatever they want. And then finally, well, there's two more, so we'll go ahead and stop here and we'll finish up next week. Uh, there's no prostration in their worship. And verse 11 says, And they say, How doth God know? And is there knowledge with the Most High? They don't bow before God. We must bow before God. God is our Creator, He's our Master, He's our Lord, and we are subject to Him. We bow before Him. They don't bow before God. There's no they value whatever they want to value. They worship whatever they want to you know, value or worship whatever they want to worship. They worship things that they value. Uh, we don't. We have to worship God. And uh, we can't value things that we want to value. Uh, but they can. And they, so they say, you know, they can say, how does God know? You know, there's no God. And if there is, I'm not going to submit to Him. They don't have to value before God. And we do. We subject ourselves. We can, we, we submit our desires and our you know, actions and our attitudes and everything to God. He is our Lord. He's our Master. He's our Creator. He's God. And we know that. And so we cannot uh, be our own Lord. We cannot value the things that we want to value. We must value the things. We must have His values, not our own values. They have their own values. They, they basically worship themselves, worship whatever they want. Uh, they make gods out of things that they want. They make gods out of themselves. They make gods out of the things that they value. But we, if we know and worship the true and living God, know that there is no other God besides God. And so we can't but worship God. We can't value the things that we want to value. We must value what is true and what is godly. And so there is a restriction. There seems to be a difference. Okay? And from a temporal perspective, uh, I can understand where the psalmist would get uh, discouraged. Uh, and maybe you come to that point in your life sometimes. You look around and you see the prosperity of those who don't seem to care about God. And you're trying to live right and you're facing hardships and trials and persecutions and, and needs and all sorts of things. And you look around and there's people who couldn't care less about God and they're just doing whatever they want, and, you know, going wherever they want, have a lot of you know, seeming prosperity. And we say, hey, that doesn't seem to make sense. That's not right. That's not fair. He has all those things, and he doesn't care about God, and I'm trying to live for God, and I don't have anything. I have persecutions. But you got to see things from an eternal perspective. From a temporal perspective, um, it, it looks good. You know, and, I, and I agree. From a temporal perspective, you, know, you see somebody with, that, you know, that um, makes money you know, in, a, in an illicit, uh, ungodly way. And they drive a big car, they have a nice house, they lots of friends, they have eat lots of good food and they you know, they seem to be successful. You, know, you look at them and then you see, you know, you're trying to live right and so you don't cheat and you don't steal and you don't do things that are wrong and so you only have what you can honestly obtain and maybe it's not as much as what those who dishonestly obtain things have. And so you say, I'm trying to do right and live right and I don't have anything and he doesn't care about doing right and doesn't live right and he's got all this stuff. That's not right. That's not fair. 
But listen, God brings hardships into your life to make you a better Christian, to help you be more spiritual, and to prepare you for eternity and your eternal rewards. The one who has those things of this earth has his temporal rewards and will not have eternal rewards. He will have eternal punishment forever and ever and ever in hell. And so it's really not good that he has all those things which keeps his eyes off of God. And so who has the better? Uh, from, a, from a temporal perspective, he has the better. And you have the worse. But from an eternal perspective... From a biblical perspective, from a perspective of God, you have better. You have much better. Much, much better. He has prosperity for, material prosperity for a temporary season, for a little while. And then he will have eternal damnation. You may have temporal hardships. You know, if, if from the day you were born to the day you died, you had nothing but hardships. Uh, if that made you godly, you would live in eternity with the results, with the fruits of righteousness. And so it would be much, much better, even if you had to live all of your life in it. Uh, so, what we experience that we think is not good is actually good. What they experience, which we th they think is good, is actually bad. Because it's leading to their destruction. And so our hardship is leading to our spiritual edification. Our hardship is leading to our growth. Our hardship is leading to our maturity. Our hardship is leading to our humility to be able to be used of God. Their prosperity is leading to their eternal destruction. And so from that perspective, what we have is good. And what they have is bad. They would be better off not having what they had. And we would be better off not having what they have. And so, look at things from a, an eternal perspective. If you look at things from an eternal perspective, then you understand. And we'll look, uh, look at it in detail uh, a little bit more next week about how uh, the psalmist arrived at that conclusion and what that changed his perspective, it changed his attitude, it changed his action, it changed everything in his life. He was envious before, and we haven't gotten to that yet, but the next point is he was envious. He, he envied the wicked. He said, that's not right, they have all that stuff, and I don't. And he envied them. But then when he finally understood, he didn't envy them anymore. He felt sorry for them, he pitied them. And he was glad for what he didn't have that they did because he had an internal perspective. And so uh, the, the problem that we face is not that we don't have what we should have. The problem we face is not that we have hardship and we, try, we should try to get out from that hardship. The problem is not we have problems and we need to solve those problems. No, the problem is that we don't see the benefit in those problems. And we don't see the destruction in the prosperity of the wicked. And so if we can bring ourselves to the point where we can see things from God's perspective, spiritual perspective, eternal perspective, then we can be thankful. We can have a conclusion that the psalmist had, that God is good. You know, sometimes maybe we don't think God is good. Maybe we think, that's not fair, God's not good. Look, he gives that person a lot of money, and he's wicked, and I don't have anything, and I'm trying to do right, and that's not right, and God's not good, he's not fair. <laughs> God is good. God is gracious, God is kind, God is loving toward us, in withholding those things from us because those would lead to our destruction. And so, if we see things from that perspective, we can thank God and we can praise God for the hardships we have in our life because we realize that they are doing good for us. All right, let's continue there next week. And so I hope you'll tune in next week. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for your grace and your mercy and your love. We thank you that you love us. Love your word says you love us. And help us not to judge whether you love us by temporal, uh, the temporal things that we have, uh, possessions and experiences. And help us to judge everything by your word. Your word says you love us, and so we believe that you love us. And your word says that these things are for our benefit. These hardships are for our benefit. So help us to be thankful for them, because we realize that your word is true, and we trust you. We love you. So live throughout this week with an internal perspective. Uh, help us to get our eyes on you, keep our eyes on you by having our eyes in your word constantly. I pray you would help us to see from your word the proper perspective on things, and get an eternal perspective on things so that we can rejoice in hardships. So that we can be thankful for tribulation and trials and not to deny, deny the faith and not to uh, 
impugn your goodness and your love. This is a good week this week. Use us for your glory. Bring back faith in Jesus' name.